taught high school science for 15 years and three years in college. And now for, since 89, uh, I've been teaching on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. What we're going to do in this class is go through my seminar material that I cover all over the world as I travel and speak. But we're going to go through at a, a snail's pace and chase every rabbit, kick every dog, you know, any questions, fair game, stop me right in the middle and say, wait, wait, can explain that, okay? Or if you know, know what some of the skeptics are saying, there's nearly 2,000 now anti-Hovind websites, okay? They are all claiming all kinds of things about me. It's really funny to read some of them. But uh, I, I want to defend my position, okay? Uh, I do take the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. God made the world in six days about 6,000 years ago. It is not billions of years old. And we'll be defending all the questions that that brings up throughout the course of the next who knows how long this class is going to take. We appreciate you coming tonight. Well, if you're listening by uh, videotape or DVD and want to ask questions, I do a daily radio program uh, Monday through Friday, uh, 4.30 to 6, hour and a half, Central Time. It's called The Creation Science Hour and a Half. I can't think of a better name for it So, because that's how long it is. But anybody can call in with questions or comments, and we get some really hostile callers from time to time. So uh, you're welcome to do that. You can listen in on our website, drdino.com, or on the uh, truthradio.com website. Either one will get you to our radio program. You can call our office anytime with questions. Uh, I don't take email. I just got up to 1,000 a week and said, I quit. I surrender. I'm going to drown in a pile of email. I was staying up till 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning answering email every day. I said, this has got to go. So I got all the secretaries together and said, look, answer it all. If they really got to talk to me, then tell them to call me. I talk a whole lot faster than I type. Okay? I can speak over 300 words a minute, and I type about 12 words a minute. So it's no-brainer as far as <laughs> which, which I should be doing what I'm most effective at. But yeah, I talk a lot faster. So we welcome any comments, and uh, we hope this class and these classes will be a blessing. One of the goals of the class is to train guys like you or ladies to, uh, to be more equipped to be able to answer people with questions. We need thousands of creation evangelists out there. I was uh, teaching science in Longview, Texas, and I asked uh, Dr. Julian Pope, who was a guy who taught in the college we had there. I said, Dr. Pope, his, his son Johnny Pope is a good friend of mine uh, at, uh, in Houston, Texas. I spoke at his church just a few months ago. I said, Dr. Pope to Dr. Julian, I said, how do you know God's will for your life? He said, oh, that's easy. I said, man, tell me. I'm going to write this down, you know. He said, no, you don't need to write it down. You'll remember it is. He said, do you want to know God's will for your life? I said, yeah. He said, well, you find a need and you fill it. He said, what's the greatest need you can see? Do we need more carpenters? Do we need more lawyers? God knows we don't need more of those. Uh, do we need, you know, what do we need? What does the world need? And I went home and I really prayed and searched my soul and I said, you know, I think think we need somebody to explain where dinosaurs fit in and explain all this creation stuff at a fourth grade level. Because I knew at the time many of the creationists that are out there that were out there speaking, and you know, I still know them, they're friends of mine, and a lot of them are really smart and a little boring, you know, and the kids just aren't gonna listen. You know, when they start talking about all this, you know, all these big, you know, twelve syllable words. The kids, you know, click, tune them out, and they're looking around the room, counting how many ceiling tile we got or something, you know, they're not listening. So I really feel like the greatest need I can see is the creation evolution battle for is really a battle for man's minds. Okay? Because if creation's true, there's a creator, and there are rules, and there's a meaning to life. If evolution is true, there is absolutely no meaning to life. So I see this as the greatest need of the century. If there's a war, I want to be in the center of the battlefield. That's, I want to do as much as I can for the Lord's kingdom on this earth, and I see this issue is it. And if I wasn't doing this, I would be supporting somebody else who is doing this. Okay? I would be their webmaster or their, you know, mow their grass, or I would do something to make sure this message gets out, because this is, you know, if you're not going to shoot, carry bullets, take care of the wounded, pay for the bullets, for heaven's sake, do something, okay? If you're not going to hold the gun, you can, you know, feed the guy who will hold the gun. There's all kinds of ways you can support a ministry like this, and that's what we... Uh, we encourage people to do. And I'd like to see some of you, uh, you know, someday say, boy, I think I could do that. And you really could. A little bit of uh, uh, anecdotal background here. I was uh, raised uh, in East Peoria, Illinois. 
my mother was a kindergarten teacher for years and taught me to read at a very early age and taught me just to love reading. You know, she taught kindergarten. So I, I still, I'm a readaholic. I'll, I always got a stack of books beside my bed at night and I read a lot. My dad was an electrical engineer at Caterpillar Tractor Company. He was in the Marines in World War II in the early days of radar. Uh, his uh, group of 25 guys that went through school to be radar for the Marines went off to the Japanese theater to fight. There was one survivor out of that group. That was my dad. All the rest of them were killed in, in Japanese, uh, fighting the Japanese in, in the, uh, the Pacific. Um, my older brother became a uh, mechanical engineer, and my second brother became a public school teacher for 34 years and retired. And my sister uh, became a beautician and had her own business, entrepreneur, and did really well. Still is in Seattle, Washington. So that's it. I got the, the four in the family. I'm number three. Uh, I was a little bit, quite a bit actually, of an introvert as a child. I would just would rather be by myself. You know, just leave me alone. I would go for walks in the woods by myself, you know, for hours and study the rocks and trees. And I, I didn't like people. I still have a little bit of a hard time with that. Uh, I'd just rather be by, by myself, you know. But God takes the least likely and says, I think I'll do something with that. So I get the glory. And so anything that's happened, it's because God has radically changed me. I was saved at age uh, 16 in uh, East Peoria, Illinois. I was raised as an early, early child in the Lutheran church. Got baptized. They sprinkled some water on my empty head, you know. And uh, we went for a while and then went to the uh, Mennonite church for quite a while, actually, until I was probably about 12 in the Mennonite church in East Peoria, Illinois. And my, since my dad was involved in World War II, he always felt a little uneasy since the Mennonites are generally... Um, you know, pacifist, non, you know, don't get involved, conscientious objectors. He just always felt a little bit like I'm on the, out, I'm on the outside here looking in. So we switched. I, of course, I had nothing to do with that at age 12, but we switched over to a Methodist church in Morton, Illinois. And at the time, it happened to be an extremely liberal Methodist church. I didn't know or care at the time. You know, I wasn't even saved. But uh, the church, did, the pastor did not believe in a literal heaven, literal hell, uh, thought the Bible was, you know, a good book, had some good stories, but basically that's about it. And so it was just a social club, basically, as far as I was concerned. I became very active in the Boy Scouts at the Methodist Church. They had a great Boy Scout troop there and rose to the rank of Eagle Scout and patrol leader and all that kind of stuff. Really enjoyed scouting. But again, all this time was not a Christian. Um, at age 16, uh, I was in high school, sophomore in high school, and a friend of mine uh, there uh, who went to Grace uh, Presbyterian Church in Peoria, which at the time was a huge church, probably still is, I don't know, but a very famous church at the time in Peoria. And... Uh, this guy was, uh, even though Presbyterians pretty much believe in, you know, you don't need to go soul winning because if God wants them saved, he'll get them saved. They're the elect, you know, all that. But he was a soul winner in spite of the fact that he was Presbyterian. And he said, hey, Kent, are you going to heaven? And I said, I don't know. I've been baptized uh, three times. I've been catechized and pasteurized and homogenized and simonized. And, you know, what else is there? He said, well, where are you going if you die? And I said, I don't know. He said, would you like me to show you what the Bible says? I said, well, sure. And he showed me the Romans road, plan of salvation, how to become a Christian. And I said, thank you, but no thanks. Because what, if I understand this right, if I invite Jesus to come into my life, uh, he becomes the boss, and he might want to change a few things. <laughs> Boy, is that an understatement. But anyway, and uh, I said, no, I'm not interested. But boy, for the next month or so, I don't know, probably a month, something was eating at me on the inside. I said, man. I'm going to die someday, and I'm going to be dead for a really long time. You know, where am I going? And so at the same time, my second oldest brother, Ross, who was the public school teacher for 34 years, he had, was down in Illinois Central College at uh, Bloomington, Illinois, not Illinois Central, Illinois State University at Bloomington, and he had become a Christian through the influence of the Navigators Bible Study Group on the college campus there. A campus group got a hold of him and got him converted, my brother Ross. Um, Ross got concerned about his younger brother, me, and called me up and said, Hey, do you want to come down and spend the weekend in the dormitory with me? I thought, now wait a minute, this is my older brother wants me to spend time with him? You know, if you have an older brother, you understand this. <laughs> this seemed a little bit strange at first, you know. I said, well, sure. So he was a sophomore in college. I was a sophomore in high school. I went down 30, 40 miles away to Bloomington, not that far, and spent the weekend in the uh, dormitory and... The Navigators ganged up on me that night, Saturday night, and said, are you, uh, are you Christian? Are you going to heaven? I said, I don't know, but I've been thinking about it for a couple of weeks now, and I'm, I'm concerned. And so they, went, again, went through the plan of salvation with me, and I did not accept Christ. 
Next morning, my brother said, hey, Kent, let's go to church somewhere. I said, okay. So as far as I remember, we just arbitrarily opened up the phone book to the church section, stuck our finger down, and there was Calvary Baptist Church of Bloomington, Illinois, or Normal, Illinois. Bloomington and Normal are twin cities. I think it was Normal. I don't know what their address is. doesn't matter. But uh, so we went. And they had uh, the preacher preached, and uh, it was Arno Winnegar who was the pastor at the time. He later moved up to become the uh, chancellor of uh, Maranatha Baptist Bible College in Watertown, Wisconsin. But he preached, and uh, I don't remember what he preached on, but I just remember I walked down the aisle and said, oh, that's enough. I want to be saved. And so I gave my heart to the Lord that day. February 9, 1969, if I recall, uh, was a Sunday. I have to go back and look. But uh, that's the day I gave my heart to the Lord, went back uh, to my East Peoria High School, and told all the buddies in school, hey, I became a Christian. And poof, they scattered. No more friends. You know, a brand new Christian. Not a friend on the planet, except for Tim, the guy, the Presbyterian, who tried to lead me to the Lord. So we went to with a very lonely couple of months there with no friends at all. And everybody thought I was kind of weird. Like, you're a Christian. You're, well, no, you're not going to do bad things with us or something. But anyway, that was uh, sophomore year in high school, and that's basically the story of my conversion of how I became a Christian. I really loved math and science, uh, always have, and really excelled at it in school because of my dad's influence. And I was probably doing trig, algebra, geometry, and trig I knew by eighth grade, you know, pretty well because my dad and my older brother were always te teaching me stuff at home. So the kids in school made fun of me in eighth grade. They called me the brain, and they put a little sign on my desk, you know, the brain, because I, I had a good dad and a good brother teaching me stuff is all. So I was way advanced in those areas. English was a whole other story, um, but we won't get into that. I still today have a hard time with spelling and, and type real slow and stuff like that. It doesn't matter. Um, then uh, went off to Bible college. After first I started going to Illinois Central College to become a, a science teacher. I thought that's what I want to be, you know, science and math. I really enjoyed it. I felt like I was pretty good at it, understood it well. And so I went off to Illinois Central College. After about a year and a half there, I just really felt like I, I ought to be going to Bible college. So I transferred to Midwestern Baptist College in Pontiac, Michigan. Dr. Tom Malone started the school and the church probably about 300 years ago, and he's still the pastor there now at 88 years old or whatever he is. He's been there for 50, 56 years as pastor of the church, which is pretty unusual. Um, and so there were about 400 students, I think, when I went there. Uh, so, you know, small school, Christian school. Just had a blast. Worked my way through school. Uh, worked second shift at General Motors, uh, doing assembly on the assembly line, and worked, went, took a... 18 to 20 hour load every semester and slept, you know, three hours a night. And I kept a journal, you know, how I felt different times. Dead tired, can't stay awake, you know, everything hurts, stuff like that. But I went through in three years. Bottom line is I finished college in three years. And uh, they offered me a job at General Motors. They said, we'd like you to stay on and be a general foreman. We want to send you to school, you know, be a foreman. Uh, at the time, I was making two seventy a week, I think, which back in 1974 was a lot of money. Okay? And uh, the pastor at the church I had been going to, Bethel Baptist in Pekin, uh, called me and said, Hey, Brother Hovind, you're graduating. Would you like to come back and be my assistant pastor? We can pay you a hundred bucks a week. I said, I'll come. So, so uh, uh, no telling what I would have been making at General Motors had I gone to the foreman school and been foreman. But uh, I was just as assemblyman at 275 a week, you know, so it would have been a whole lot more net. But I was thrilled. I said, man, I'm going to get in full-time Christian service. And so that's what I did. Took a huge cut in pay and went and served God. At the time I was married, my wife and I were married before my senior year. We got married just before my senior year in college. She went one year with me to Midwestern uh, Baptist College and then uh, took her 18 years to finish her degree slowly over the next, you know, 18 years with three kids. And moving a bunch of times all over the country, but she stuck with it and finally finished her degree here in Pensacola, which is why we're here, so she could finish her degree. So, is that enough background? Anything else you guys want to know? 6'1", uh, 200 pounds, probably a little too much, but uh, uh, three children, all married, and dog died. Okay, so I take the position, like the Bible says very clearly, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Here we have the Bible claiming to be inspired. Well, if a book makes a claim like that, you know two things. Either it is or it isn't. I don't know of any other options, okay? If it isn't the Word of God, you cannot say it's a good book because it's lying. It's a bad book. I like Josh McDowell who said, uh, Jesus claimed to be the Lord. So either He's the Lord, He's a liar, or He's a lunatic. 
There are no other choices. He's got to be one of those three. The Bible claims to be perfect, claims to be inspired, infallible, inerrant. We can go through all kinds of verses on that. You do that in a Bible of Doctrines class. You know, the Bible makes a lot of claims about itself. Now, Aristotle said in 400 uh, BC, uh, it's called Aristotle's Dictum, D I C T U M. Aristotle's Dictum was if a critic is criticizing a document, the benefit of the doubt goes to the document. Because the document can't get up and defend itself and say, hey, that's not really what I said, you know, <laughs> that's not what I meant. So the critic must absolutely prove his point beyond a shadow of a doubt, or the document would win the argument if there's a critic versus a uh, document such as the Bible. It's called Aristotle's Dictum. We have people all over the world criticizing the Bible, and it's been my experience now for 36 years of reading it intently, uh, bunches of times. The Bible is absolutely the anvil that has worn out many hammers. There's a lot of folks that beat on that book. And it has stood the test of time. You know, they're gone. It is still doing just fine. That scripture, 2 Timothy, that all scriptures given by inspiration of God is so true. Every single word. I see things as I read my Bible over and over and over. I see new stuff comes out every time. It's like, wow, why didn't I see that? This morning, 4 a.m., whatever it was, I was reading Daniel chapter 6. And it says, Darius the king set, you know, th th three guys to be presidents, uh, of whom Daniel was the chief. So here's Darius the king with three presidents, Daniel and two other guys whose names are not given. And they said 120 princes of the provinces. So their system of government was, you know, Darius the king, three presidents, 120 provinces, and then who knows what else. Later in the chapter, uh, two of the presidents got together with all the 120 princes, and they said, uh, hey, we've got to get rid of this Daniel guy. You know, he's, he's a Christian. We've got to kill him somehow. Get rid of him. So there was a big conspiracy. They went before King Darius later in chapter 6. And I just saw this last night. I said, Why, how did I miss this? They said, King, all the presidents and captains and uh, the host has gotten together and decided we should make a decree that if anybody prays to anybody else, you know, they should be thrown into the lion's den, et cetera, et cetera. They lied. All the presidents did not get together and say that. Daniel's one of the presidents. He wasn't in that vote. I'm sure he, he didn't vote on that. Okay? Uh, and so that's in politics. I've seen, of course, we've had our share of attacks here at our ministry, and I've seen that. They're just absolutely willing to lie. <laughs> and they just lied about King Daniel, about uh, President Daniel, and got him thrown into the lion's den. Actually thrown into the den of lions. A lot of the new versions say lion's den. There's a big difference between a lion's den and a den of lions. A lion's den can be the place where they live, but there's no lions in it. The den of lions means they're there, okay? <laughs> so it wasn't just a lion's den, it was a den of lions, and the King James is very careful to make that distinction. And we'll get into King James' issue much later, but I take that to be inspired, infallible, and preserved Word of God. So the Bible is given for instruction, it's given by inspiration of God, for it's profitable for doctrine, the word doctrine means teaching, for reproof, that means, hey, don't do that. Knock it off. You know, whatever you're doing, quit it. Okay? It's always reproving us. Saying, don't. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life, the Bible says. Just get used to it. You know, start it with your mom and dad when you're little. You know, no, no, no. Slap your hand, whatever. And as you get bigger, it becomes a paddle or a ball bat or whatever when you're teenage years or something, you know. <laughs> and that's just the way, that's the way of life, okay? So to get used to it. You know, I tell my kids, life's rough and then you die, okay? Get used to it. Okay, that's the way it's going to be. But the Bible is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, reproof, correction and instruction in righteousness. Four amazing things. You could spend an hour talking about that verse. That's not what we're here for. But that is my position that the Bible is indeed inspired, just like it claims it is. The word inspire means to breathe in. The word spire is the root meaning we have expire. When somebody expires, they die. They breathe out. Uh, you prespire, you know, uh, inspire means to breathe in. Here's the Bible is claiming, and many other verses go along with this, that the Bible claims to be God-breathed. It's actually His words breathed through somebody, you know, writing the pen, flawlessly inspired. So I believe that is true. Now, the Bible, I tell people, in case you don't know, is the basic instructions before leaving earth. You really ought to read the book because you're going to be gone for a really long time when you leave this planet. Okay? Be sure you're going to the right spot. That's your basic instructions before leaving earth. It's called an acrostic or a pneumatic device, something to make you memorize. There are all kinds of pneumatic, mnemonic devices. I'm sorry, pneumatic is air pressure. Pneumonic device is something to help you to remember things. And there's so many things that will help you 
do that. We'll get into some of that later. So, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, one of our jobs, one of my jobs as a Christian, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Our job as a Christian is to provide answers to the rest of the world. I distinctly remember as a brand new Christian, age 16, right across the woods from us, there was a little valley, a little gully with, uh, you know, probably 50 yards wide, and another subdivision on the other side of the gully. Uh, it was in Twin Oaks, Illinois, off Highway 150 between East Peoria and Morton. You can check it on a map. Who cares? I lived on Willow Court, 216 Willow Court. Right across uh, from, uh, from our house was that you go down the woods and you come up in the backyard of uh, Mike Quinn. Mike Quinn uh, had a sister who was, Mike was my brother's age, my brother Ross's age. His sister Colleen went to school with me. She was my age, actually born a day before me, January 14th. I was born January 15th, 53. So Colleen and I were good friends going through school. We lived you know, near each other and, uh, uh, and his brother, the brother Mike was uh, a sophomore in college at the time at, at uh, Bradley University, which was in Peoria. And I, here I was, brand new Christian. And I was going to this independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist church and you know, reading my Bible and really growing rapidly in the Lord as a new Christian. And so I became concerned about Mike, who was Catholic, and my brother's best friend. So what my brother and I, you know, I went over by myself one night and I started talking to Mike. Mike was a sophomore in college studying uh, engineering at Bradley and had been taught all of the evolution stuff that people are taught going through college, and I tried to witness to Mike. And I absolutely got nowhere. Zero. Couldn't dent the shell he had around him because he believed in evolution. And I had only been saved, I would guess, two months, maybe. I don't know. But I realized right away as a new Christian, if nothing else, this evolution theory <coughs> is a great hindrance to the gospel. This is going to keep Mike from getting saved. He won't even examine the possibility that the Bible is literally true because of his belief in evolution. So that started me on the trek of saying, you know, this theory is a problem for Christianity. Then as I began to grow in the Lord, I said, my pastor told me I had to get rid of my reviled substandard perversion from the Methodist Church and get a real Bible, go get a uh, uh, Schofield reference edition. So I went and bought, you know, the Schofield Reference Edition, the old Schofield that had the proper names index at the back. You know, I've still got it on my shelf. It is really falling apart. But uh, Schofield, uh, Masonic Lodge member, Presbyterian, you know, had several things was wrong with Schofield. Good notes in many places, you know, brilliant Bible scholar, but he definitely caused a lot more problems than good, I think. He taught the gap theory, that there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2. And so he's the one who really made it popular. Uh, came out, after, several other people after that, so that's what, I, that's what I believed for a long time. I said, oh, I'll just take this billions of years and stick it in the, in the middle of the Bible between these two verses and forget it. Because I was majoring and you know, I was taking all the science classes I could and I was being taught the earth is billions of years old. And I, I knew right away if I'm reading my Bible, I said, that, the Bible doesn't say that. So where do we fit billions of years in here? Oh, Schofield has the answer. St slide it between these two verses and forget it. And that was my uh, compromise, I guess, for, for years. As I read the Bible cover to cover many times, dozens of times, and memorized whole passages, I just really was trapped, not knowing it, by something I'd been taught. I had put on Schofield's armor instead of putting on my own armor, like David, you know, said to Saul, I, it's not my armor, I gotta, I gotta, so I've not proved it. So, as a brand new Christian, I realized this evolution theory is a hindrance. I got nowhere with Mike, never did, I haven't seen him for years, so I don't know if he ever got to become a Christian or not, but uh, didn't get anywhere with Mike. And Throughout the years, I've met many people that this was their hindrance. And if my job, 1 Peter chapter 3, is to be ready to give an answer, I think it's important that we as Christians be ready to give an answer. I think I'm prepared now, after 36 years, 52 years old, to be able to give an answer to most people on most of these topics. And that's what I want to pass on to you guys, uh, because I'll die someday. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do, but it is going to happen, okay? And we need thousands more people out doing this. When I really felt the Lord called me into this ministry, uh, after talking to Dr. Pope, I said, man, that's the greatest need I see. You know, Find the need and fill it. Greatest need is creation ministry. So I, I got to, down on my knees and I said, now Lord, if you want me to go into the ministry, I want to explain something to you, Lord. There's a few things about your children that I don't like. He said, me too, son, quite a few. 
you want, you want to see my list? I said, no, that's okay, Lord. Uh, I said, if you want me to do this, I'm not going to uh, tell people they can't copy my stuff. That's just always bothered me. Here's somebody's got this great message, and you know, I can't share it with my friends without giving them another 20 bucks or something, you know? So I said, I'm not going to copyright my stuff. Uh, we have copyrighted it now, only to the point where people cannot sell it, okay? Because people were taking my videotapes and altering them, taking a phrase here and a phrase there and putting together, making me say things I didn't say, you know? So we, and the only way to stop that legally is to have a copyright on it. So it's copyrighted, but you can still copy it if you're giving it away for free and you're not altering it. That's the rules now, okay? So um, I said, I'm not going to copyright my stuff and I'm not going to charge anything for my seminars. People are going to ask me to come speak. That's great. If they pay me, wonderful. If they don't, fine. Uh, and that has happened many times. Uh, and I'm not going to send out a letter every month begging for money. I get a stack of newsletters every month, you know, all these missionaries, all these ministries. And it, the Bible says money answereth all things. I understand. It costs us over 20000 a week to operate this ministry here. Okay? So many of you are on staff here. You know, it just, it, we do a lot of work here, but how would you like to have to spend 20000 a week? <laughs> sink your ship in about three hours, right? Uh, so I said, I'm not going to send out a letter every month begging for money. It does cost money to run things. I understand. Believe me, I understand. But uh, I said, I just don't like that idea of, you know, every month get another newsletter begging for money. I'm not opposed to asking for money for projects we got going, and I've done it many times, but I just I hated that monthly thing. So that was my policies when I started this thing 15 years ago. Just me, my family over on Burgess Road here in Pensacola. We then moved over here to this house where we're in now 15 years ago. Been there added on a bunch of times, including this building and a bunch of other buildings, but it has slowly grown. I think one of the greatest needs of America today, of the world today, is to get people that have an answer that can share it with somebody. What's the answer? We get calls and letters every day from people questioning, hey, what's, what's the truth about this, you know? In spite of how many times I've answered the question, what about carbon dating? I got another one today on the radio program, you know? What about carbon dating, you know? Last week up in Alaska, I was speaking up there during the Q&A time, and one of the students, well, doesn't carbon dating prove you're wrong, Hoven? And so I get to my PowerPoint and flash through a bunch of slides, and no, it doesn't. We'll get to that much later. But uh, no, carbon dating actually proves the Earth is young. And I was University of North Florida. I spoke, uh, did a debate six months ago, eight months ago, against two professors. And uh, they said, if you're going to videotape this, we're not coming. So we couldn't videotape it. That's one of the, it was a really good debate. We don't have it on tape, though. But after, during the debate, there were three kids on the front row, three college students on the front row with great big signs they brought. You know, Hoven's a liar, Hoven's ad hominem attack. You know, they all got these signs that are fla flashing up, you know. Finally, I said, guys, look, if you want to, you know, speak to the crowd, you need to schedule your own time and get your own, you know, you could probably rent this room like we did and, you know, put up advertising like we did and say, hey, come, I want to speak on creation or I want to speak on evolution. But, you know, do that with your crowd, okay? This group sponsored this meeting, and they want me to come and debate these two guys, so put your signs down, please, okay? <laughs> but anyway, afterwards, <coughs> during Q&A time, these guys really had some just, they were angry. I mean, it was just fuming, angry, you know, asking questions, and I was answering them. And every time they asked a question, I would flash up PowerPoint, because I've got answers to most of the stuff. i got over 7,000 slides, and just in my seminar, not counting all my other presentations I've got, I've probably 40,000 slides in here. So they... Uh, <laughs> they were asking the questions, and I was answering them with, you know, PowerPoint documented right, documented right on the bottom. And uh, I said, now, guys, you've asked about nine questions, okay? There's a thousand other people here that would like to ask questions, okay? How about, let's schedule, I'll come back and debate you three some other time. <coughs> and they said, okay, but you can't use PowerPoint. <laughs> that was there. And the whole audience just laughed, of course. They realized how stupid that was, you know? Oh, you don't really, you don't really want an answer, do you? Okay. Uh, so anyway, I think our job is to be ready to give an answer. We have my whole presentation of PowerPoint slides available. Anybody can buy our startup kit on creation. And it uh, comes with a videotape on how to do PowerPoint for boneheads, okay? We assume the person knows nothing. Here's how you plug it in, okay? Touch, push this button, turn it on. Because I had an awful time learning computers. I was just born too late, okay? It's, not, it's my mother's fault. But uh, I just didn't get it. They would say, we're working under Windows. I'd say, no, the window's over there, and I'm over here. What do you mean? What's this Windows stuff? I mean, it was, I remember the first computer I got, uh, I was here in Pensacola, and I, no, I, I turned it on, and I called back to the guy that I bought it from, 
And I said, there's this little thing flashing at me on the screen, and it's right in the way where I'm trying to type. What is that? He said, that's the cursor. You need to move the mouse. I mean, it was that bad. Okay, Adam, you're a computer expert, I know, but I was way down on the learning curve, okay? <laughs> Had a long ways to go. So we produced this videotape, PowerPoint for Boneheads, because I understand people, the frustration of, I don't understand what you're talking about, you know, because it's, it's a real simple startup kit. And we've helped about five, probably 500 people now start ministry similar to this using our material. And if you don't like something, well, then edit it out, okay? If you don't say, I don't like your blonde jokes. Okay, well, then cut them out. All right, don't tell them. I'm blonde, my sister's blonde, my mother's blonde, my daughter's blonde. I have a right to tell blonde jokes. I have earned it, okay? So <laughs> I do tell lots of blonde jokes, and I love them. And we'll tell plenty in here in the class. So anyway, our job is to be ready to give an answer, and I really think most Christians are not ready to give an answer. And we hope this course will help you be really ready, loaded for bear. Go take them all out. Three things I try to accomplish in my seminar. I've tried this, tried to accomplish this in my 36 years of being a Christian. This is my goal. My, this is my whole philosophy of life. I want to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. That would apply to everybody. If anybody's a Christian on the planet, I want to strengthen their faith. We spent $30,000 translating our videotapes into Russian several years ago. Those tapes have gone all over Russia. It took us five years to recoup the $30,000 we invested. We finally, after five years, had sold enough tapes in Russian to recoup just the investment. I think now if we added it up, we probably have made about $1,000 profit, okay? <laughs> the Russians copy stuff anyway, whether it's copyrighted or not, it doesn't matter to them. They just copy it, so they, <laughs> they wouldn't matter. But they are spreading all over Russia. It's incredible the number of, I mean, like tens of thousands of people that have seen our tapes in Russia on creation. And it, we get calls and letters all the time. My daughter-in-law, Tanya, who's Ukrainian, you know, translates the letters for me from, from Ukraine and Russia. That people, or Pavel, you know, speaks Russian, and her, her, her brother. And the testimonies will just make you cry, you know. Man, this, here I've been raised in communism for 70 years, and your tapes answered all these questions at all. Oh, thank you so much. You've really strengthened my faith. That's awesome. Okay, That's better than having a fast motorcycle or a big car or a million dollars in the bank. Knowing you help somebody strengthen their faith. Number two, if somebody's not saved, I want to try to get them converted. I am consumed with trying to get other people converted. That's my goal in life. And I think that ought to be every Christian's goal. Okay, You know, when kids get to a certain age, they want to start replicating, you know, making more people. Let's get married and have some babies, okay? That's normal. That's the way it's supposed to be. Okay, I'm 21 now. You know, let me f find a wife and have some kids, okay? I think as a Christian, you ought to get to the point where pretty soon it's, you know, I really ought to be replicating. I should be making more Christians. That should be our job. Our goal in life is to replicate ourselves, and duplicate what we have and get other people converted. So definitely that's what I want to do. Number three, if somebody is saved and they're not doing much for the Lord, then I want to make them uncomfortable. I have people say all the time, Brother Hovind, you make me nervous, man. You know, well, are you doing something for the Lord? No. Well, then you ought to be nervous. Okay? Good. I'm glad I'm making you nervous. Uh, one lady came to Jack Hiles up in Hammond, Indiana. He died, but I'm speaking at the church up there here in a couple weeks. And, uh, this lady said, I don't like the way you go soul winning. He said, well, how do you go soul winning? She said, well, I don't do it. He said, oh, well, then I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. That's for sure. <laughs> I'd rather do something than nothing. I don't know if everything we're doing here is right. Uh, we started a museum. We're in the middle of it here now. Should we have a creation museum? Should we have Dinosaur Adventure Land? I, I don't know. It works. You know, I don't really think God cares much how we do it. I think it's more important that we do it. If I tell my kids, clean your room. And I come back later and find them playing around and the room's not clean. Hey, uh, I told you to clean the room. Well, you didn't say pick up the dirty clothes. <laughs> okay, kid, listen. If I say clean the room, I expect you to figure out all the details, okay? I don't want to point out every sock and say, you know, pick it up. God told us in His Word five times to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our job. We'll do it. And if you're not done doing it, well, then keep doing it until you get done. We've got an expression around here. Some of you guys just started working here recently, but the expression I've told the people who've been here for a long time, I said, I don't want to hear about the labor pains. Show me the baby. You know, here's the job. Albert, mow that grass. I come back two hours later, the lawnmower wouldn't start. 
Okay, well then get a scissors, okay? Get the weed eater, go buy a new lawnmower, fix, mow the grass, okay? I don't want to hear the excuse, I want to see the results, okay? Show me the baby, make it happen. Uh, so that's our job is to get non-Christians non converted and Christians uncomfortable. And I always start off my seminar with this picture and I say, this is not my wife, that's just a picture of her. <clears throat> and that's true. Last uh, summer, or this summer, a couple months ago, uh, we were taping this now in August or September 2005, this uh, was our 32nd anniversary. And I tell people, we sat down on our 32nd anniversary and figured out how much money we have spent since we got married. We have spent all of it. And then some, actually, quite a bit more than that. <clears throat> My wife was raised in a pretty liberal Baptist church in Peoria. <clears throat> and uh, her dad was a general foreman at Caterpillar Tractor Company. Her mother was an uh, organist at their church and uh, worked at a bookkeeping type stuff, tax accounting, stuff like that. Uh, good family. Both of them, her, her, dad, her dad now died a couple years ago, but uh, mom is still alive up in Arkansas, in Bowdoin, Arkansas. So anyway, that's my wife, and uh, we live now here in Pensacola, Florida. Been here since uh, January of 89. We moved here just right after Christmas, during the Christmas break, so she could start college over here at Pensacola Christian College, where your sister is going, Kevin. And uh, that's where she got her degree from there after 19 years. She crammed her four-year degree in the 19 years, we tell everybody. But uh, we have three children, we got them all married, and the dog died. So we made it, praise God, home free. My kids, you can see by the dates on their birthdays here, are a year and two weeks apart. Called family planning. Uh, my wife kind of hated, hated to see June come around there for a while. <laughs> no, no, another kid. But uh, that was, uh, got them all married and the dog died. My daughter's wedding, of course, been played on America's Funniest Home Videos. Have you guys seen that, her wedding? You've not seen that? You have? Albert, have you? I don't know if you can hear the volume on this. Uh, we'll, when we tape it, we'll get the volume on there. She, of course, is one of my secretaries. And uh, uh, it's kind of a joke that I get phone calls all day long around here. I mean, I've always got my cell phone on one ear, my other phone on the other ear. So they, she asked me, and I was honored, you know, Dad, would you do the wedding? I said, I'd be honored. I've done quite a few weddings, probably, probably four or five hundred. And I said, I'd be honored. And so here For was the For as much as you, Paul, wedding. and you, Marlissa, have freely and deliberately chosen each other, and have openly declared your desire to be united in marriage. Yet in the presence of God and these witnesses, you pledged your love for each other. Hello? Yes, Lord. No, I wasn't calling you, but okay. Um, the Lord says he would like you to know that uh, what he has joined together, let no man put asunder. <laughs> Paul, uh, you, you may kiss your bride, he says. Here's the Lord calling. <laughs> They've played it now, I think, over 15 times on America's Funniest Home Videos. They never got any money for it, and I thought they should have. But, uh, anyway, so that's uh, daughter. And anyway, we got them all married. The dog died. It's wonderful. All, all of them live right around me here, as you know, that work in the ministry here. My daughter and her husband live next door. The other two kids live down the street and have four grandkids so far. And for those that don't know, grandkids are God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. Because especially with Eric, we thought about it on a daily basis, you know. Maybe we should go ahead and send this kid to heaven. Uh, but we didn't, praise God. <laughs> and he turned out pretty good. He's still got a few lumps to knock off, but he's doing good. So there's the whole tribe. They all work in the ministry. And you guys uh, here tonight, for this class anyway, I'll do too. So we appreciate you coming. Um, we have quite an amazing team here, a wide range of uh, political and religious uh, bodies here represented. We have uh, the whole spectrum, I think, which is good. I really like that. Um, Jesus, if you look at his disciples, it's pretty interesting. He had Simon the Zealot. If you study the history here, the zealots in that time were the anti-Romans, blow up the bridges guys, you know. These, we're on, the Romans took over our territory, let's go kill a few tonight in the middle of the night, you know. They were the terrorists of the uh, Jews of that day. Let's get rid of these heathen Romans in our country. He also had Matthew the tax collector as a disciple. Now if you study the history of that time, the tax collectors were the Jews who had worked with the Romans to tax their own people and everybody hated them. Nothing much has changed when it comes to tax collectors, but everybody hated the Matthew the tax collector. He's, 
He's one of Jesus' disciples. I mean, Jesus had a wide political spectrum on his own, his own 12, you know. And so we have quite a spectrum here. We have uh, our, our token Lutheran that we always pick on every day, you know, asking if he became a Baptist yet. No, not yet. I said, keep reading that Bible, brother. You can make it, you know. So uh, I'm not against that. We have uh, a variety from different, <laughs> representing different colleges. And we have an eclectic staff, I believe is the correct word. But we do an awful lot of work around here because we want to change people's worldview. I remember the first time I heard, even heard about the idea of a world view, I thought, man, that makes so much sense. I never heard those words put together before, world view. I said, wow, that's powerful. The world view is the way you view the world. There are two world views and only two. There was a Russian atheist astronomer who came to America years ago and he said something fascinating. He started off his speech, now the guy's an atheist, he's a famous astronomer, and he said, either there is a God or there isn't. I thought, now that's, that's good logic. I mean, you can't argue with that, okay? <laughs> either there is a God, <coughs> either there is a God or there isn't. And then he said something so profound. He said, both possibilities are frightening. Wow. Both ways, it's pretty scary. If there is a God, then we better find out what he wants and do what he says. Because he's the boss, you know, he owns this place. If there is no God, that's frightening. Because we're hurtling through space at 66,000 miles an hour. And nobody's in charge. <laughs> that's a scary thought. Nobody's driving at 66,000 miles an hour. So really, it is frightening that there not be a God. We'll get into much later some of the logic of how do we prove the existence of God, but just briefly, I think you can prove the existence of God by the impossibility of the contrary. I want to write that one down and think about it. You can prove the existence of God by the impossibility of the contrary. It is impossible that there not be a creator. It's not possible that there not be a creator. You take something simple. Swiss Army knife. This is why Switzerland, by the way, has never been invaded. Here we have an ink pen in the side of my Swiss Army knife. If I can get it out of there. Is it possible for something like this to happen by chance? Can anybody even imagine a story that would explain how this could happen by chance? You can't even come up with a good story. You certainly can't come up with any proof or evidence. You can't even get a good story how it could happen. It's just too complex. If you're in the middle of an iron mine where they're digging out iron ore, there is iron ore all around you. And you find a nail on the floor of the iron mine. Just a nail. What do you conclude? the nail was man-made, even though it's made out of iron. It is impossible that the nail not be man-made. All of human experience tells us natural forces do not make nails. They don't. It's impossible that there not be a designer just for a nail. Even though you're in the middle of an iron mine, you still know it was created, it was designed. It is just intuitive when you look at something as complex as a cell in the human body or, or a hand or a, 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 a feature of the body like the digestive system or integumentary system or nervous system or you know, any uh, re uh, respiratory system. It's just not possible that there not be a designer. You don't have to see the designer to believe he exists, okay? Just the design d demands a designer. When you find a watch, you know there was a watchmaker, Paley's argument from years ago. Darwin read Paley's book and was, was very frustrated by the book because he never could get an answer to it. Uh, and some of the atheists now, like uh, Dawkins, thinks they've got an answer. You know, the blind watchmaker. It's a dumb theory he's got in that book. We'll talk about that later. But uh, it's just not possible that there not be some kind of designer. So you can prove the existence of God by the impossibility of the contrary. It is just not possible that there not be a creator. Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break here and we'll get into the... Uh, Great questions, four great questions in life, and how the evolution theory offers an answer and how the creation theory offers an answer. We'll come back right after the break. 
Okay, welcome back, and uh, we're going to talk now about the four great questions of life and how your worldview affects this. These are fundamental questions that, if you really stop and think about it, every single religion on the planet tries to answer these questions. Every philosophy tries to answer these questions. Hinduism, Buddhism, atheism, which is a religion, by the way, you have to believe there is no God. There's no way you can know something like that, so it's something you believe. Uh, every philosophy and religion on the planet tries to answer the four fundamental questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? The way you answer those questions is determined totally by your worldview. For instance, uh, the Muslims have a philosophy that answers those questions. The Catholics have a philosophy that answers those questions. The Baptists have one. The Buddhists have one. Every religion you can think of, one of the primary things they try to do is answer those questions. And how do you answer them? Well, that depends on your worldview. Some people look at this world and say, you know, <clears throat> it's amazing. A Big Bang made this world from nothing. There are atheists who really, really believe that. I guess. I mean, they tell me they do. I can't imagine that they do, but they, they claim they really honestly believe it. Anyway, that is called the humanist worldview. The humanist worldview says there is no God. Man is the ultimate creature. We're it. We are God. Which is what Satan said to Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know, ye shall be as gods. We'll get into that later. But humanist worldview is very common. I mean, a lot of people hold to this worldview. It, it doesn't make it right. I mean, even if everybody believes something, that doesn't make it right. Okay, the fact that a lot of people believe something does not make it right or wrong. It's just interesting to point out that a lot of people believe this based on the evolution theory that really we got here by natural causes. This is called naturalism versus supernaturalism. Supernatural is something beyond the natural. If I, suppose we all lived on an island, okay, and we had a rule on our island, a philosophy, that nothing exists outside of our island. There is nothing else. We're it. There is no world out there other than water, ocean, okay? And one day a computer washes up on the beach. Well, on our little island, we don't have computers, man. We never saw such a thing. So we look at the computer. <clears throat> now keep in mind, we have, a, we have a rule. Nothing exists outside of the island. So I want you to explain how the computer came to be using only naturalistic explanations within our little island. You're going to have a real problem. So somebody's going to analyze the computer and find out, oh, hey, this has silicone in it. Well, silicone is modified sand. And we've got sand all over the beach. Maybe lightning struck the beach and melted the sand and turned it into these silicone chips. I mean, we really could get some really wild stories if we worked at it and try to figure out a natural explanation for the existence of the computer. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> to the average thinking person, of course, that is ludicrous, but we've got scientists today, and, and, non and people today, not who are non-scientists, who have decided in their little brain, nothing exists outside of the natural. We have to explain everything with a naturalistic explanation. So in their mind, they've already excluded the idea there can't be a God. How do we explain life with a natural position, from the naturalistic position? I think they've already shot themselves in the foot by their definition. Okay? Just like those guys on the island already excluded the only logical possibility. Uh, somebody outside the island made that, guys. No, there is nobody outside the island. Okay, okay well, then if you want to limit yourself to that, you go ahead. But there's going to be a whole lot of stuff you cannot explain, like when an airplane flies overhead. You know, oh, oh, what was that? <laughs> it doesn't exist. Ignore that man behind the curtain. You know, uh, pay no attention to that man. Uh, and so there are people who have just absolutely limited themselves. They've locked themselves in this little tiny box called naturalism, and they just deny that anything else exists out there. And I've done 93 debates now with these professors who believe that, and that they have just, I think, handicapped themselves mentally by their, their philosophy, their worldview. Their worldview says 
We're it. There is nothing outside the natural. Well, that's quite obviously false for many reasons, and there are people who deal with this type of argument uh, from other perspectives, you know, the, how to prove the existence of God. Josh McDowell has great stuff on this, you know, uh, how to prove God exists, and that, that's not our field of uh, research for this class. But there are plenty of things out there. Ray Comfort has some good stuff on his website. Uh, but that's one philosophy, one worldview that people choose. They choose to hold this worldview that we came here by purely naturalistic methods. There is nothing supernatural in the world. Now, the other philosophy or worldview, and there are only two, the other worldview you can have is you could say, wow, there's incredible design. There must be a smart designer, and that is the creationist worldview. The only two worldviews you can have are creation and evolution. The Russian atheist was absolutely correct. Either there is a God or there isn't. Plain and simple. If there's a God, find out who he is, find out what he wants, and do it. Okay? He owns this place. If there is no God, we're in trouble. We're going through space 66,000 miles an hour, and nobody's in charge, and we've got a real serious problem on our hands. I mean, if we are it, we are in trouble. I think man has shown in the last few thousand years that we have the capacity of killing each other by the tens of thousands and not batting an eye. Or in the case of Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot, we can kill other people by the millions. Just, we can, we're going to annihilate ourselves if there's no God. Okay. Uh, evolutionist Arthur Keith, who uh, was a uh, strong believer in evolution theory, he, uh, there's some question of was there a 1959 100-year anniversary reprint of Darwin's book? I, I have not seen it and I haven't researched it, okay? But one person in the last 16 years of my speaking said, Hoven, there was no 1959 reprint of Darwin's book. So I don't know, I have on my footnotes here of the slide, that he wrote the foreword to Darwin's book for the 1959 100-year anniversary reprint. If that is not correct, tell me and I'll correct my slide, okay? If somebody can find out the truth on that. But there's no question he was a famous evolutionist and he wrote frequently on the subject of evolution. And there's no question that he did say this. He said, the law of Christ is incompatible with the law of evolution. And he's absolutely right. These two are mutually exclusive. You can't say both are right or there's a mixture of truth between them. No, it's this or this. He said the two laws are at war with each other. And he was absolutely right. Now, Arthur Keith chose to be on the side of evolution. That was his choice. Okay. If you want to believe you come from a rock, you just enjoy yourself. I don't care what you believe. But they shouldn't be calling that science. But he, even the evolutionists know that evolution and Christianity are mutually exclusive. One is wrong. And the evolutionists generally have no respect for the theistic creationists, who, or theistic evolutionists, who think, God used evolution to get us here. They have no respect for him either. Okay? There are sort of three camps, you know, creation, evolution, and compromise, but neither side wants the compromisers, okay? Um, the, certainly the evolutionists do not. They understand these two laws are at war with each other. Somebody's wrong. Well, let's just uh, philosophize here for a minute. Suppose the evolution theory is true. How would you answer the great questions? Who am I? What am I worth? If evolution is true, you're nothing. You're not worth a thing. You're actually part of the problem, you see, because you are one of the polluters of the environment. And the more of you we can kill off, the better the planet will be. We can save Mother Earth by killing you off, because after all, you're taking up living space, you know? If evolution is true, and you really think about who people are, people are nothing but protoplasm. We're animated meat. We are molecules in motion, and we are absolutely not worth a thing. And if you happen to kill somebody, oh well, the strongest survive, you know? That's just the way it is. Where did I come from? What is the origin of the world? The origin of, you know, not, I don't mean you came from your mother, I know how that works, but uh, where, did you, where did mankind come from, okay? Well, if evolution is true, you came from a cosmic burp called the Big Bang 20 billion years ago. Why, I mean, why am I here? What's the purpose of being on this planet? What is the value of my life? 
I mean, when a person lays their head on their pillow at night and they're thinking, you know, who am I? What am I doing here? How did I get here? Why am I here? How do they answer those questions? And everybody goes through these things. Every religion on the planet tries to answer those because every person on the planet asks themselves those questions at some time or another. You all have, I have, we all do this, okay? Why am I here? Well, if evolution is true, there is absolutely no reason to be here other than have fun, pass on your genes to the next generation. I've also often asked evolutionists this question because they'll say, you know, the whole purpose of life is to pass on your genes to the next generation. All you live for is, you know, you know improve the species or pass on the species, ensure the species survives. I say, guys, I've got a simple question I want to ask you. Why did every species on the planet <clears throat> evolve the ability to reproduce more of its own kind? Isn't that going to just increase the competition for food? Why didn't somebody evolve the ability to live forever? Wouldn't that be smarter? Hey, I got the whole place to myself. Let's just live forever. All of them have evolved the ability to produce more of their own kind, which increases competition for the food supply. That doesn't sound smart. They never answer the question. They can't. You know, I've never had, if you're watching the tape and you got a good answer, I'd like to hear that one. Why is it no animal evolved the ability to live forever? Why are we here? Of course, the Christians have an answer to that question. You know, all these questions. Christianity offers a very different answer to these questions, okay? Evolution offers an answer. Christianity offers an answer. Where am I going when I die? It doesn't take you long on this planet to figure out you're not always going to be here. Okay? You're probably going to be three or four and you're going to have grandma or grandpa or uncle or aunt or neighbor or somebody's going to die. I remember as like a third grade child walking home from Pleasant Hill grade school and seeing all the ambulances and the police and all the people gather around one of our neighbor's houses. And I, whoa, what's going on? You know, bright lights, you know, third grader, you know, what's going on? The mother had been giving the baby a bath in the sink, and the baby had reached up and stuck her hand in the toaster. Electrocuted her, killed her instantly. 18 months old. That's the first death I remember, you know, as probably a third grader. But uh, you probably all have some memory of the first person you know of that, you know, the first time you heard about them, die. What's that mean, die? You know, wow. We had another neighbor three doors down from us, 18 years old, died of cancer when I was probably eight or nine or 10, I don't know. Then we had uh, somebody just a block away had some kind of disease, uh, a real severe osteoporosis where the body just consumes its own bones. And I remember this person was only in their 20s or 30s, if I recall. But my mom and dad were telling me, oh, you know, they roll over in bed and break their shoulder or break their hip just by rolling over. You know, their bones are like eggshells. And it didn't take long of that, you know, and they broke a rib and pierced their lung or something, and they died, okay? It doesn't take us long to figure out, we're going to die too. And everybody goes through that stage where they sit there wondering, where am I going when I die? That is what I went through for several weeks after I had been witness to and reject rejected Christ. That's when the Lord began eating at me, saying, Hovind, you're going to die. Everybody knows it, but nobody wants to think about it. Okay? We try to, you know, that happens to old people. It doesn't happen to young people. It happens to everybody. People your age have died. Go to the cemetery, walk around, look at the tombstones. You can find somebody your age. Guaranteed. <laughs> There's people that, and they never thought they were going to die. Are you kidding? I'm not going to die, man. Look, I'm only in my teenage years, you know. I'm going to live forever. You're going to die. Where are you going? Well, evolution offers an answer to this. You go back to the ground and you become worm food or plant food, you know, whoever gets you first. You become fertilizer. That's it. You're done. Christianity offers an answer that says, well, yeah, your body dies, but there's more to you than your body. There are three parts to humans, a body, soul, and spirit. You are not only alive, you are aware that you are alive. That's different than plants. As far as we know, plants are alive, but uh, if you can call it alive, but they're not aware that they're alive. They have no spirit or soul. Animals are alive and are aware that they're alive, but they are not aware, apparently, of the Creator. No pig ever prays before his food, you know. I used to say that in the high school cafeteria, you know. 
I was a Christian. I'd pray for my food, and I'd get up. People were looking at me and say, hey, did you guys know that pigs don't pray before they eat? <laughs> that stare, dumb stare on their face like, oh, did he just slam me? Maybe just a little bit. Sweetly, of course, in Christian love. But uh, where are you going when you die? Everybody wants to know this. The Egyptians thought, you know, you die and you go to this, you know, big long home in the sky. So they sent everything with them. You know, the guy's going to need this. You know, they put all their servants in there and killed them. You know, sometimes they built whole ships inside these pyramids. He might need this ship when he gets up there. Here's a bushel of wheat. He's going to need some food, you know, when he gets up there. They really, everybody through history has had a philosophy or a worldview that tried to answer those questions. And there were, you know, and Satan, of course, has been involved in manipulating these worldviews through history, but getting people to believe some extremely dumb stuff. You know, like the uh, Inca Indians and Mayan Indians and down in South America, they thought, you know, well, man, we got to appease the gods, and the only thing they want is blood. So let's get a bunch of these slaves we conquered, you know, these people we conquered, and we'll go, you know, put them, carry them up the top of this pyramid, cut their heart out, and pour the blood down the, down the steps, you know. Just rivers of blood. They, they had a philosophy of life. They thought that would appease, you know, the gods of some kind. Um, there's a great book out called Eternity in Their Hearts. Has anybody ever seen that? Or uh, Peace Child, have you read that? Isn't that incredible? Eternity in Their Hearts. If you want to read a book that will change your life forever, uh, that's one of the ones you ought to read. I'd put that in the top ten books everybody ought to be reading. A missionary, Don Richards' son, uh, wrote this book. He's, each chapter deals with a different uh, culture, a different tribe of people, and how they got reached with the gospel. Oh, it's phenomenal. One of the chapters in there is called Peace Child, which also is a whole separate book. It's in our library if you want to check it out. Peace Child is phenomenal. Somebody said, Brother Hovind, you've got to read this book, Peace Child. I said, yeah, right. I, get, I hear this 30 times a day. You've got to read this. You've got to read this. You've got to watch this, okay? They said, would you just read the first five pages? I said, okay. So that night, I read the first five pages and was hooked. Could not put it down. Read the whole book that night. <laughs> it's one of those that will just grab you and draw you in. Have you seen Peace Child too? That's, it'll grab you and pull you. Anyway, everybody has a philosophy. And even the pagan tribes with the bone in their nose, you know, they have a, they have a philosophy. They, have a, they, they really think, you know, they've got, they've got these four questions answered. And sometimes it's the witch doctor that has the secret knowledge and you have to go to him and bring him a pig or a chicken to get this knowledge. You know, what's going to happen to me when I die? And people have such a desire to answer these questions. They do some amazing things. There are some movie stars with bazillions of dollars that absolutely are scared stiff of dying. And so they want their body frozen and kept in a perpetual state of chirogenic, you know, uh, freeze them in, in case they find a cure for my disease, bring me back to life. There's a lot of folks that are frozen, you know. The Bible says many are called and a few are frozen or something like that. But uh, that's in the non-inspired ver non version. But, uh, huh? Second, Second Opinions, chapter 4. There's a lot of good stuff in Second Opinions. Albert, you ought to read that book. There's some amazing stuff in it. Uh, <laughs> you wrote it? Okay. Just about anything you want's in there, actually, okay? You can, but the whole idea of having a worldview and answering these questions is, is powerful, and every religion has one. The Japanese, before World War II, had a worldview. When Darwin's book was translated to Japanese in the late 18, mid-1800s, 1865 or something like that, it took the Japanese world by storm. They loved it. Japan really swallowed the evolution theory early on. So did Germany, by the way. The Japanese uh, blended it right in with their, with their pagan religions. And they said, well, hey, obviously if evolution is true, one of the races has evolved farther. I mean, you don't have to live long on this planet before you be looking around and saying, you know, there are some different kinds of people. There are black people and, you know, red people and yellow people and white people. Uh, it's, the differences are pretty obvious, you know. <laughs> You can see it on their face. So, I wonder who is superior to who. Now, if evolution is true, that gives you a philosophy to work from, and you make all your decisions based upon your philosophy. Okay? You decide right and wrong based on your philosophy. Uh, you decide you know, why things are the way they are based on your philosophy. So, the Japanese said, oh, wow. Obviously, the Japanese are superior. And so, there were actually scientific studies that were done by Japanese scientists that showed the Japanese have less hair. There are very few Japanese people with beards, okay? They have less body hair, and they have uh, milder body odor. Their sweat doesn't stink as bad as other races, okay? And so they said, see, that's proof we have evolved farther. 
So really, it's anybody else who's not Japanese is inferior, and they're just taking up space on this planet, so you know, they'd really be better off dead. And when the Japanese conquered uh, or captured a lot of the American and British prisoners in Corregidor and in Bataan in the Philippines, first of all, they couldn't understand why these people would surrender. I mean, you just don't surrender. You fight till you're dead. That's the way the Japanese were taught. You know, you fight till somebody kills you. Okay, you go to the death. Secondly, they got all these prisoners, like 70,000 of them, and they thought, well, these are, just, these are just animals. They're inferior. They're not Japanese. I mean, you know, look, they got more hair. They're closer to the apes. So there's no value to their life. And so in the De Bataan Death March, I don't know how many died, a lot. I mean, uh, Mike Quinn I told you about earlier, you know, they tried to witness to, his dad was fighting the Japanese. And uh, he, a Japanese guy came up with a bayonet and ran it right through him, whoosh, pulled it out, and left him to die. Well, he didn't die. But as a kid, I remember I was very impressed when he opened up his shirt and showed us this big scar on both sides, front and back. The bayonet went all the way through. Missed all his vital organs, just right between them. <laughs> that was Mr. Quinn. Um, but the Japanese have this philosophy, and your philosophy determines how you behave in every case. You take a headhunter. Here's a little boy raised in a headhunting tribe, and daddy sits him down by the fire and says, Now, son, when you get bigger, you can go fight our enemies. And if you ever kill one of the enemy tribe, cut off his head. And be sure to eat the brains, because then you will get his power and his spirit. Well, you teach that to a kid for, you know, 15 years, and guess what he's going to do when he goes off to battle? People behave based upon their belief. Powerful statement, your beliefs determine your behavior. What do you believe? I was at uh, uh, Alaska last week, and uh, one of the guys in the audience during Q&A time was very upset, and he said, man, evolution's a fact, and uh, he said, otherwise premarital sex wouldn't be okay. He said, I don't see anything wrong with premarital sex. He brought it up probably six or eight times. I said, well, obviously, you know, if evolution's true, you're right, but does the girl's dad have an opinion on this? Probably the first time he ever thought about that, you know. Uh, does the girl's brother have an opinion on this? I'm sure you have an opinion on it's okay, but what about him? Does he have an opinion, you know? What about your future wife? Do you think she's going to have an opinion about this? What about this girl's future husband? It may not be you, you know. You think he might have an opinion about this? Do you think he may, he may come look you up someday at 2 in the morning? <laughs> have a talk to you in a language you can understand? You know, you know. <laughs> sure, I'm sure you think it's okay. I mean, obviously, duh, but uh, what about him, you know? And is, if there's a God, then He makes the rules, and we just better find out what He says and do it, period. So anyway, the point is, your worldview or your philosophy is so incredibly important. How do you view the world? Powerfully important. And two great worldviews, only two. The Bible teaches clearly God created the heaven and the earth. So here's God claiming that He did it, and so the Christian worldview is, God made the world, we're here to please Him. When we die, we go face Him one day, and we're going to be judged. And fortunately, He's provided a way for us to be forgiven. Very fortunately. Okay? Satan, though, came to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. Now, as far as we know, this is the first sentence out of Satan's mouth in, that's recorded in Scripture. First thing he did was to try to raise doubts about God's Word. He's been doing it ever since, okay? He still tries to raise doubts in everybody. I remember as a young Christian, just a brand new Christian, going to church, reading my Bible, how I was just plagued with doubt. You know, are you sure you're saved? And I, I went down to the altar probably 70 times. <laughs> Lord, just in case you didn't save me last time, save me now, you know? How many of you went through the same thing? Now, come on, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, good. <laughs> I didn't want to feel lonely here. Um, <coughs> the Bible says, Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and to save men's lives. He not only wants to save your soul, he wants to save your life. Satan knows once you become a Christian, he can't have your soul. You are going to heaven, but he can still destroy your life. He can still keep you from being fruitful. And he does it by raising doubts. 
See, if you're busy questioning your salvation for five years, you're not going to be winning anybody else to the Lord because you're busy questioning yours. Effective tool. He wins. You should have been bearing fruit, but man, I'm not sure I'm saving myself, you know. <laughs> that's great. For Satan, of course, that's, uh, that's the way it works, okay? So the first thing he did was raise doubts about God's Word. That's a fascinating thought because that's exactly why there are so many Bible versions. Do you realize the confusion in the mind of the average Christian, even a well-grounded Christian, been a Christian for 25 years, when they don't think, they, you know, they th they're not sure which Bible is right. Or they think, maybe there's some here. And when I hear preachers get up in the pulpit and say, well, it says in the original, they've never seen that original. <laughs> I've never seen it. Nobody's seen anything in hundreds of years. When they correct God's Word, that subconsciously makes them look important. You know, you need me to explain this book. Boy, it's a good thing for you that I'm here. You know, here, give me some money and I'll keep teaching you, okay? It also, psychologically, in that person's mind says, wow, where is God's Word? I mean, this really has a damaging effect, I think. And when you finally get it settled, man, this is God's Word. I'm holding a copy of it. It's like, wow, it's such a relief, you know, to know I've got it. Satan, though, it tries to muddy the water. In any war situation, you, you go into the enemy's side and you try to turn road, sides and road signs and blow up bridges and, you know, confuse them. Bring confusion, okay, if you can. It's normal in wartime, and this is a war, for Satan to try to bring confusion in Christianity. And one of the great ways to do it is, hey, let's publish 151 Bible versions. I think there are 151 now available. That's the last number I heard of, in English, Bible versions. Keep in mind, in order to get a copyright, you have to be at least 10% different than the rest of them. How on earth do you get 151 Bible versions, all of them 10% different from each other? Maybe it, uh, something's different. <laughs> Real different, okay. But anyway, we'll get into more of the King James issue later and why God's Word, and where is it, stuff like that. It took me 30-some years to get there, so I'm patient with Christians that aren't there yet. So if you're not there yet, you know, I understand, and we'll, we'll get you converted before it's over with. Cover more on that on video 7. The second thing Satan said to the woman, I say Satan because later we find out it was Satan in the serpent, okay? The serpent beguiled Eve, uh, and we find out that was Satan in Revelation chapter 12, okay? The great dragon, the old serpent, the devil, okay? The serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. I want you to look at the sequence here. The devil said three things. First, he raised doubts. Are you sure? Second, it's an outright denial. Ye shall not surely die. He's denying what God said to Eve. The third thing, though, is classic, and this always follows this sequence. He said, God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. First, you raise doubts, then you deny, and then you deify mankind. This is humanism right here. Eve, you can become God. Wow. That's, that's pretty cool. How would you like to be God? You know, Bruce Almighty. You know? <laughs> I'm God. Uh, that's what Satan said to Eve. And the sequence of events is classic because he has never changed his tactics. Satan still does that very same sequence today. And that's what evolution is all about right here. Genesis 3, 5. Ye shall be as gods. See, if you think about evolution theory, we started off like an amoeba, and we have progressed and gotten bigger and better. It took a long time. A lot of people died to get there. A lot of creatures died to get us there, but we finally made it. And here we are. We are God. We're the God of the universe. There's nobody but us. We'll get into more humanism on seminar part five, probably in about six years. But um, this idea that man can become God started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. It is still exactly the same tactic today, and this is everything evolution is about right there. There are many uh, evolutionists now who are claiming that man has evolved physically about as far as he can go. We don't need to improve. We're, you know, we're doing fine. We're in good shape. So the next evolution in, in humanity will be spiritual, where we recognize that we are actually God. Uh, who was the uh, lady that stood on the beach, you know, and said, I'm God, you know? <laughs> uh, Alice, what's her name? We'll get into that later. I've got slides on that. I've got a video clip of that. It's hilarious. Um, 
I'm God. <laughs> no, you're not God, okay? Uh, but this idea that man can be God came from Satan and the devil of the, uh, Satan in the Garden of Eden. And that's what Star Trek is all about. That's what all these, you know, Lost in Space movies are all about, that, wow, we have evolved, but look at this. There are other cultures that have evolved farther than us. Whoa, wow. You know, someday we're going to sail around the universe and discover these new life forms, and we are going to someday take over the universe, and wow, we made it all the way to the moon. Oh, wow, two light seconds away. <laughs> Boy, have we arrived. Yeah, <laughs> we have done nothing. Diddly squat, zip, zero compared to what's out there. And we'll get into more of that later about the size of space. But the idea that man can be God is, is one of the, Satan's favorite tricks. He used it on the Mormons. The official Mormon doctrine right here. Say, exaltation is eternal life, the kind of life that God lives. He is a creator. Notice it's a small c. We can become gods like our Heavenly Father. This is exaltation. The Mormons teach, if you are a good Mormon, someday you get to become God. When a Mormon prays and says, Heavenly Father, they are praying to Adam from the Garden of Eden. They think Adam became the God of this world. After all, he's the father of everybody here, so he's the God of this world. And someday, if they're a good Mormon, they get to go start their own universe, and they get to be God of their universe. The Mormons have a slogan. They say, as God is, I shall be. As I am, God once was. They think God used to be a man, and someday they get to become God. That's their official teaching. And the Mormons have a philosophy of life that answers the great questions, like everybody has a philosophy. They teach that the God in heaven has thousands of wives and has sex all the time and produces spirit babies. And if the spirit babies are a good spirit baby in heaven, they come down to earth, and the human couple here only provides the physical body. Okay? The human couple produces a body. God in heaven produces the spirit. And just before the baby's born, the spirit comes in, and you know, as soon as the breath of life comes in, spank the baby on the butt, you know, <sighs> they get the spirit. Now, if it was a good spirit baby in heaven, it is given a white-skinned body. If it is a bad spirit baby, it's given a black-skinned body. That's what they teach. Now, they don't want you to know that for sure, but that's what they teach. That's why for years, no Mormons would never allow a black people to, get, uh, to become Mormon uh, uh, missionaries and elders and priests. Until they wouldn't let them go to Brigham Young University until they found out they're pretty good at basketball. So then they said, oh, well, we need some of them on our team, you know, so foot, basketball and football. But for years, it was Mormon doctrine, no black people allowed, because after all, they're, they're subhuman. They must have had a bad spirit baby. They must have been a bad spirit in heaven. There's a couple of good books. Now, Mormonism, A Way That Seemeth Right by Aubrey, uh, is a great book in the way that it asks questions about Mormonism. Now, he believes some other things, or L. Aubrey, whoever that is, I don't know if it's a man or woman. The other things that, the, uh, that I would strongly disagree with, okay? So the fact that I recommend a book in my seminar by no means recommend, means that I recommend everything that person believes, okay? I've learned early in life you have to eat the meat and spit out the bones or you will choke on something, okay? And you have to learn early in life to do that, so there is some good meat in this book. There are also some bones that uh, I would, you know, uh, caution you about, okay? So again, just it'll be, it'll be that way all through my seminar. The fact that I recommend something does not mean I wholeheartedly endorse everything that person believes. It has to be that way, okay? I don't even believe everything I believe, okay? I argue with myself sometimes, okay? So, <laughs> but the book, Secret History of the Mormon Church, is really powerful. If you want to study Mormonism, it's in the library. You can check it out for those of you that work here. But uh, the Mormons have taught for years. Uh, their Bible, their doctrine still teaches, if anybody quits Mormonism, you have to kill them. And there were some massacres that were incredible where people were killed just for trying to leave Mormonism. And that book exposes all of it, The Secret History of the Mormon Church by eyewitnesses who were there. This one, Mormonism, A Way That Seemeth Right, is simply question after question after question to ask Mormons. Like one, one question is, hey guys, the Book of Mormon says, if you have more than one wife, you're damned to hell. Doctrines and Covenants, which you also think is the Bible, says you have to have more than one wife or you're damned. So, which is it? <laughs> How can they answer a question like that? You know? There's no way to answer a question like that. Um, 
it's just it's really powerful soul-searching questions that I think Mormons ought to read and say man they're right there's a great videotape out now called Book of Mormon versus DNA it's in the library if you want to get into Mormonism see the Mormons teach that some of the Jews came over to America and they became the Indians so there ought to be you know Jewish DNA and Indians obviously and they just finished a huge study and said no Indians are not Jews so any Mormon that's honest, that looks at the evidence, ought to really be troubled and say, you know, maybe we have been lied to. And they have been. They have been. Joseph Smith was an incredible liar. Okay? Study the history of Mormonism. It'll blow your mind. Probably the world's experts on Mormonism are Gerald and Sandra Tanner. They wrote this book, uh, Mormonism, Shadow or Reality. It's in our library. It is small print, and the book is like yay thick. I mean, you couldn't read it all if you tried. But it is thoroughly documented, everything you, everything you ever wanted to know and a whole lot more about Mormonism. Gerald and Sandra Tanner's, Tanner's website, and Gerald is, if he's still alive, he's got to be, you know, in his 80s. Okay, he was pretty unhealthy the last time I saw him out there, which was seven or eight years ago. But uh, so I'm sure somebody will take over their work. It's utlm.org, Utah Lighthouse Mission is what it stands for. They're right in Salt Lake, and the Mormons hate them. They were Mormons for 30-some years, really understand Mormonism thoroughly, and have documented everything. It's phenomenal. That's the, I think, as far as I know, the Mormon experts. There's another website, mormonchallenge.com, that has a lot of good stuff on Mormonism. And again, with websites, same as books, the fact that I recommend a site does not mean I recommend everything on it or everything they believe. So keep that in mind. Thelma Greer wrote this book, Mormonism, Mama and Me. It is a much softer approach to reaching the Mormons. It is kind of grandma talking to the grandson. Now, listen, son, you know, do you really believe that? Now, come on. You know, it's just a, it's a, it's not the hard slap you in the face approach. It's the softer grandma approach. So if you want to reach a Mormon, uh, gently, that'd be the book to get. Okay. Uh, the Mormons, uh, Catholics also teach uh, in their catechism that the Son of God became man so that we might become God. There are very few Catholics who believe this and very few who even know that their book teaches this. And I get criticism on this occasionally. Uh, it's in, the catechism has been published by two different publishers, so it depends which one you have. It's either going to be on page 116 if it's from the Ignatius Press or page 129 if it's the Doubleday version. But the fact is, that is what their book teaches. So, you can read it for yourself. And I've had people write me nasty letters saying, no, the Catholics don't believe that. You don't understand what the guy was writing about. I can, just, I can read just fine, okay, and that to me looks like he's saying we get to become God. Now, if you have to go back and reinterpret it for me, you know, it's like a politician, you know. I misspoke, you know. No, I heard you. I heard what you said. <laughs> you lied. Why don't you say that? You lied. Okay, they don't ever say that. There are some good books available in the bookstore next door if you want to get books on Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or Catholics. Uh, I'm not anti-Catholic. I'm not anti-Mormon. I'm not anti-Jehovah's Witness. I am for truth and against error, period. If something's true, I'm for it. If it's false, I'm against it. And it doesn't matter where it comes from. If it's false, I'm against it. If it comes from my mother, if it comes from my brother who led me to the Lord, if it comes from my pastor. You don't ever want to say I'm anti-Mormon or anti-Catholic or anti-Baptist or anti-Lutheran, okay? I'm just simply for truth and against error, end of story. And I think that's the attitude we should always keep on everything, okay? What is truth? The fact that, you know, your pastor believes something, okay, that's great. Well, listen to him. But don't ever get into this mess of saying, I believe everything anybody says, even especially me, okay? Check it out. Search the scriptures. See if those things are so. Kenneth Copeland said, God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did just that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not subordinate to God even. Adam was as much like God as you can get, just the same as Jesus. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifest in the flesh. Well, Kenneth, you are crazy. <laughs> that is heresy. Copeland said, you don't have a God in you, you are one. I've got the audio clip here. You don't have a God in you, you are one. 
Are we gods? We are a class of gods. Because you want me to tell you something? You are Jesus in the flesh. You and I can stand up and say, I will be like my most high God. And to him it's dedication and consecration. The devil stands up and says, I'll be like the most high God. And God says, shut up. He's out of his class. But a man's not out of his class when he speaks those words. Jonathan has a whole collection of these. Uh, audio clips of these people really saying this stuff. It'll just blow your mind. You've got to be kidding. They really are saying it. Uh, Kenneth Hagin, another television evangelist, said the believer is as much an incarnation as was Jesus of Nazareth. The believer is called Christ. That's who we are. We're Christ. Sorry, Kenneth. You're crazy too. This whole concept that man can become God started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. It's still going today, and that's what the evolution theory is all about. And we'll cover more on that next week. Any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt any time. I'll repeat the question so we can get it on tape. And uh, we'll, guys, want to hope you enjoy this. What's the kind of stuff we're going to cover? Probably for the next year on uh, my seminar, because there's a lot of stuff. I just wish I could slow down and talk about it, but I'm in such a big hurry to blast through everything, you know, so this would be great. Okay, thank you so much. See you next week.